Hi, welcome. I'm Michael Yardney, and with me today is my business partner at Metropole Wealth Advisory, Ken Race. Welcome, Ken. Hi, Michael. Now, Ken and I have decided to do more of these informational, instructional webinars because we used to do a lot of travelling around Australia, do seminars around Australia, and I guess this is the new up-to-date way of doing things. So thank you for joining us. And I just want to explain this is not a sales webinar. There's no nothing to sell at the end of uh, the session. So it's educational and it's informational. It's the sort of information and research that we do at Metropole to help uh, work out where the next property growth spots are going to be, where we're going to have economic growth, uh, population growth. So we're going to peek behind the curtains at some of the research that we do. And at the end of it, if you do want to have a chat with Ken or our team, sure, we'll tell you how to do that. But the main intention is to give you lots of information and today it's about the economy and there's lots of charts and graphs but we're going to debug it for you we're going to unpack it for you we're going to simplify it for you so do yourself a favor turn off your mobile phones i have turn off the other distractions we're going to hope to get it through in half an hour and because there's lots of good information at the end of which it will give you a better idea of how you personally can research because you're going to understand the research we do, but not just what the research is saying, how we think about it, which I think is more important. And Ken, you've been a student of economics for a long time. I know you love digging into all these things. So we've got some fun graphs to show the people, haven't we? We certainly do. And it's the grease that makes the cogs go round. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so let's get on with the, 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 the graphs. Ken, I'm just going to um, actually... Start with a picture of somebody who, um, well, let, let's, uh, I've got to move one more slide. And uh, let's try once more. This is Philip Lowe, the governor of the Reserve Bank. And he recently uh, gave a speech talking about the fundamentals that are keeping our economy strong and our property market's strong. And I think that's a really good place to start with. So let's actually have a look at this one, which is interestingly showing um, that uh, over the last little while, our population has grown at about 1%, 1 1.5% per annum, while most developed nations have grown at about 1% per annum or less. So that's one of the strong fundamentals, Ken, isn't it? It certainly is. And uh, if we sort of dissect that chart, that sort of 1.7% growth roughly takes into account 1% uh, migration into Australia. And the interesting statistic on that is that over 80% of the migrants coming into Australia are under 35. So potential taxpayers, potential home builders, good workers for the economy, and uh, very strong, if you like, longevity that they're going to remain in, in Australia and will work towards uh, increasing our, uh, our country wealth, for, for want of a better way to describe it, and also to have uh, babies, which well, is the right. other part of it. Right we need them as the baby boomers like you and I are retiring. So this graph does show that uh, over a, a, a large percentage of uh, more than half the population growth is coming from overseas migrants. And we know that in general, they're coming from India and China. Interestingly, they're at a higher level of education than the average Australian. And what this shows is they're coming uh, with the ability to get jobs, to work hard. They're not taking the average Australian out of a job. During the mining boom, sure, we brought a lot of people around uh, b b because we needed certain other skilled jobs. Um, but these are people who are helping us transform from a manufacturing country to an information-based country, aren't they, Ken? Correct. And they're the ones that are going to be paying the taxes when the baby boomers are sort of uh, through their working life and uh, are either self-funded retirees or um, if they haven't saved enough um, through government assistance. But they're also feeding, if you like, a lot of the other Centrelink uh, payments through the uh, taxes that they pay. So this graph shows what we were just talking about a moment ago, that uh, the net overseas migration by age, they're generally younger. If we go back a bit, what it also uh, showed was that we're, in general, 
not building enough stock for the rising population. Interestingly, there are clearly some areas where there's an oversupply, uh, say the, the Brisbane CBD, certain areas of the new off the plan markets in, in the outer suburbs of, of Sydney. But uh, for the average areas where uh, most of these people want to live and where most Australians want to live, there is a bit of a shortage of supply. So we're not building enough properties uh, for, for these people who are at a young age, as you said. Um, this is actually showing how Australia is becoming a younger country. And this is good. So this is the forward forecast of what was going to happen to our population growth going forward 20, 25 years. Now it's actually suggested that we're going to be a younger nation. And that's good for our economy, Ken. Correct. Um, and what's interesting, when we compare Australia to many other parts of the world, if you like the the age demographics, the Australia's population at the older end of the scale is growing at a much lower rate than most other developed countries. So that means we're retaining a higher proportion of young people longer in the Australian economy compared to other countries. Well, this is a combination of a number of graphs explaining that. So our median age compared to 37 other advanced economies. So we're not comparing ourselves to um, the, the uh, underdeveloped countries, but to advanced economies, Ken. What this is actually showing is that um, we've got a lower median age. It's a good to be a young country. Look what's happened to Japan and those older countries. Um, we're actually <laughs> a more fertile country than a lot of places. Yeah, and I looked at that and wondered why, but uh, maybe it's the water we drink. Uh -huh. <laughs> And our life expectancy is good. So um, it, it's all looking positive. So yes, there are problems with this large population growth. The, the politicians are telling us that our infrastructure isn't coping. And you know what, they're right. But one answer is to lower our population growth. Of course, the other is to actually spend more money on infrastructure, which is a great way of spending government money, Ken. It certainly is because infrastructure consumes, if you like, more Australian products, you know, um, uh, and labour. You need local labour. Whereas if and you're going to be building jobs. a, a yeah. coal mine, uh, you're importing a lot of the machinery. And uh, while there's a lot of workforce there, it's very specialised. And that's when we saw in the last resources boom, a lot of the migration came from specialty workers that now isn't at the same high level. Well, one of the concerns we had in the past was that as the baby boomers are retiring, most of them don't have enough money in their kitty. Most don't have enough super. Many are going to be dependent on the pension. Many are going to uh, have to have more health care. And how's the government going to pay for it? And really, the only way they can do it is by uh, having more taxpayers. So importing people who are at uh, taxpaying age is very good for the economy, but it's also good for our property markets because while these people initially start renting, eventually they're keen to buy homes. And when they buy a home, even when they rent, they've got to buy televisions and refrigerators and carpets and things like that. So it's all very good for our economy. I know some people are suggesting it's a Ponzi scheme, but there's so much room for us to grow. Such a big country and such a small population. We've only just reached 25 million. Um, the government has set a business plan. Just like uh, businesses have, the government's business plan is to increase our population. And while it may tinker at the edges a bit, it's this strong increase of population to 40 million people uh, that's going to underpin our property markets. And it's also the wealth of the nation, the fact that these people have got jobs and can afford to pay and can afford to buy properties. That's all very good for us, Ken. It certainly is. I mean, the biggest issue in Australia compared to a lot of other countries is our migration tends to be centred on two or three locations, call it the Sydney, the Melbourne. And a lot of those people are within those cities are coming into the CBD area. So there's a lot of pressure put on infrastructure, housing uh, and jobs. But really over the long term, it's very difficult to turn on and turn off that tap. People think for a while before migrating somewhere. So really it's people are coming in. The job of government now is to actually, if you like, help distribute that uh, migration 
to other areas and to make it attractive and to build the infrastructure, the high-speed rail, etc., to actually give people lifestyle other than central business districts of the two or three more populous areas. Okay, now we're going to look at the latest graph pack. Every month, the Reserve Bank sends out a set of graphs and also gives us some information about it. But the charts and graphs are interesting, but you've actually got to understand what they mean. So first of all, I guess the reason we do this, and we do this research at Metropole, is we recognise that property doesn't work in isolation. The Reserve Bank's uh, ideas about interest rates, about where the economy is going, um, all those things affect our property markets. And for some of the people watching this, Ken, I'm sure they're in business, this will be very relevant to them as well, or professionals. So let's start with the world economy. We're not doing too badly. Not doing too badly at all. Um, GDP, that's gross domestic product, that's what we produce either for local consumption or for export. So um, Australia is very lucky that we're in this part of the world where our education is required, our health services, a lot of food. So we're moving to a services economy more than a manufacturing. The other thing, of course, is coal, iron ore exports uh, in volume terms are certainly very high. And we've certainly seen over the last handful of years prices have been uh, growing. So current prices certainly for um, uh, iron ore is almost at the level as higher than what it was in the early uh, 2000s. So a lot of tax, a lot of income, a lot of employment is coming from that. And we're actually sitting in that part of the world that actually likes a lot of the things that we can produce and uh, create. Well, you can see from the graph on the screen yeah. at the moment, the major trading, our major trading partners, are uh, their economies are doing better than the world averages. And sure, there was a period of time where the world was sluggish, we were worried. And sure, there's still parts of the world that are having troubles, political, social, uh, economic. But overall, uh, they're doing well. And America is doing amazingly well at the moment, Ken, despite all the concerns about Donald Trump. Correct. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, I only heard uh, very recently, in fact, today, although uh, it's hard to put a date on it, given that it's a, it's a webinar, that um, the taxes that uh, the US economy generated in the last 10 months is the highest that they've seen for quite some time, even after they had a tax uh, uh, reduction scheme last uh, October. So and the, the reporting is showing the American the reporting season showing the American country, companies are doing very very well, and interestingly, uh, this is Australia's economic growth, and we're growing at around three percent per annum. But the Reserve Bank is suggesting that this may drop a little bit to somewhere between two point five and two point eight. But there's no sign of a recession in sight, Ken. Correct, and what's interesting is if you overlay that growth of uh, you know two and a half percent maybe as a as an average number that's well above inflation so um, if you sort of take that into account we're actually creating value in the economy here in Australia okay now around the world inflation has been low and that's been one of the concerns inflation is low and uh, that's one of the things holding interest rates down and also wages growth. Uh, and it varies, but the advanced economies in general are doing a little bit better than they were before. Australia's inflation is at the lower end. The Reserve Bank wants to keep it in a range between 2 and 3%, Ken. Why is that? Because high inflation will drive up prices. So therefore, it'll make goods that you buy this year dearer than the previous year. It'll drive up uh, wages. When people have got that extra income, they will then spend more and chase the goods, which pushes up prices again. So inflation is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy of creating an overheated economy. And one of the traditional levers the government had to reduce that was by increasing interest rates, which, you know, we know the, uh, the outcome of increasing interest rates. So they've got to balance that inflation, interest rates, 
and wages, and more importantly, employment, to get to a balanced position. So it's pretty boring. We're chugging yeah. along. We're not doing amazingly. We're not doing poorly. We're chugging along reasonably. Um, but if you read the media, Ken, you'd think that we're in for a stock market crash, a property market crash. Some of the uh, wild people are saying recessions as well. But that's the, the, the world in Australia. What about the average Australian household? How are they going? Look, I think it's one of these, uh, you know, glass half full um, e equations. So um, with very subdued, subdued uh, wage increases, there's large parts of the population that are doing it tough. So they're seeing their, uh, the cost of living grow, particularly energy um, and some of those other uh, staple uh, requirements, while they haven't seen their wages grow. So they are doing it tough, and those then that don't have a job are doing it tougher again. So it's really trying to say is, the gloss is certainly not there, but it, it's an economy that's improving and all the indications are that we're going to start seeing some wages growth. The government is going to want to try and make sure that doesn't get overheated, but uh, in balance, you've really got to say, how much am I spending versus how much of my, my income is coming in? Now, with the graphs on the slide at the moment, what we're seeing is the top chart shows consumption, in other words, what we're spending, and that's going up a bit. On the other hand, the blue line is showing our disposable income, what's left over is going down a bit. And part of this is then we are spending, but we're digging into our savings. So before the global financial crisis, before 2008 on the bottom graph, you can see that we were spending more than we were earning. Our savings ratio was negative. And then all of a sudden we started to stash our cash and we were really cautious. We were worried what was going to happen. That also isn't good because if you're not spending and making the economy go around, that's an issue as well. But slowly, slowly, you can see our savings ratio go down. And only this week I heard that credit card debt, the average credit card debt is just starting to creep up a bit. So um, that's in some ways a concern because we don't like people using credit cards for consumer debt because people think the money on their credit card limits theirs. And it's not. It's the banks it's and you're not, paying yeah. a premium you're paying a premium, you're paying in advance to, 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 to get it. So our households are okay, but you're 100% right, Ken, some are doing it a little bit tough. Having said that, this next graph shows how our net wealth has gone up significantly over the last 30 years. A large part of it is due to dwelling prices, our houses, because the average Australian isn't like you and me, Ken, and owns investments, but it's the value of their house that's gone up, so their net wealth has gone up, Dwellings have gone up. Their other financial assets like their super has gone up. And while debt and liabilities have gone up, not at the same rate. So the average household is doing okay, Ken. Correct. And it's, it's almost uh, that old saying of asset rich, income poor. Mm. Uh, you know, you can't spend the bathroom, so to speak. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. um, <laughs> what, what we've seen is two things. Uh, house prices growing and uh, particularly in the major capital cities um, and in selected areas of those cities. But we've actually started to see superannuation uh, uh, growing, particularly with the super guarantee. That's the 9.5% that uh, employers are putting into the super fund. So at um, over $2 trillion in the, in the super fund industry, it's, it's a very large sector that's there for people to tap into in retirement. And really what the government is trying to say is, let's see if we can save a little bit more so that we're gonna be less re uh, reliant on government at retirement. Now, I'm gonna put in a shameless plug. I said this was an informational uh, webinar and it is, but a few weeks ago, you and I did a webinar on self-managed super funds and uh, there is, looks like there's a window of opportunity for some people, definitely not for everybody, to set up a self-managed super fund and buy a property in a self-managed super fund. So if you're watching this webinar and you're finding it interesting and you're wondering, hey, is setting up a self-managed super fund appropriate for me? 
Go to property update and in the search bar, just do self-managed super fund or SMSF, I think is the better one. And then you'll actually be able to watch Ken and I, and Ken explains who self-managed super funds are for, who self-managed super, who shouldn't go into them. Again, in general, not specific advice for you. And then also how some people are able to buy properties in their self-managed super funds um, when they can't get extra funding outside. And this is part of this ongoing educational series of webinars that we're planning to do, Ken. So household wealth in general is doing okay, even though it's taking a bit of a dip at the moment. Another factor that we look at when we want to see how property markets are going, a forward indicator is what's called um, uh, consumer confidence. People, when they're confident, spend more. They spend more on cars, or on big consumer items, on upgrading their homes, on buying investment properties. And when they're not confident about their financial future or their jobs or the political uncertainty, then they're more likely to put their hands in their pocket. Um, overall, more people are confident than they're not confident. It's above the 100% line there or the 100 mark line, the index, I should say, Ken. But, but it's very fluctuating. And boy, with all the mixed media and the political uncertainty, that's understandable. Correct. It's a very fickle thing. It's, uh, you know, when you're happy, you're joyous, you spend. If you're uncertain of the future, you, you contract. And that has a very quick impact on the economy. Because if you don't go out on Saturday morning and, and, and buy your consumer goods, your electronics, that's an instant hit. Conversely, it's an instant um, uh, uplift if you just go out. So, Consumers' sentiment is very significant, as is business sentiment. Because if businesses are feeling confident, uh, thank you, Michael, for, for the next slide, then they're going to do one of two things. They're going to start producing more. So we've seen in Australia, as uh, we had seen in other parts of the world, stock levels were being diminished. So sales were coming out of stock as opposed to new production. So new production is people, is raw materials, it's distribution, and then the businesses then start hiring. And when they're finding it harder to hire because there's more people in the, uh, in the employment, then that's when we'll start seeing some wages growth. Right. So some are, some sectors are, employing people and others aren't. Yeah. This graph shows that the finance services uh, are doing okay, but clearly manufacturing uh, and mining uh, isn't. And I think we're going to see in the near future a drop in construction. We know that currently uh, there's not many new building permits development approvals coming through. There is still a lot of construction happening in the next yeah. year or two with development approvals taken on a couple of years ago and sites still coming out of the ground. But that actually may create a bit of a hit to general employment, to increase unemployment a bit as uh, these building workers who in the past used to work in the mining industry are going to lose some jobs. Ken, I hope the government is going to take this up with infrastructure spending. You'd hope so uh, because they're similar skills and certainly when we're talking about um, construction of dwellings, apartments, those sorts of things, they're many years in the planning. So that's why we're seeing those projects that are currently started, they'll uh, be completed over the next couple of years. So people aren't now investigating into new projects that will take over once the current ones are finished. So infrastructure, I think, in Australia is going to continue to, to expand and grow for quite some time, if only because of the lead time to start, but also to finish. And can I say, you know, maybe as a dig to some of these um, uh, people who are creating infrastructure, they build them too small to start off with. <laughs> then yes. they're going back and having to expand a road, expand a, a bridge. And the cost of that expansion is quite significant compared to the original cost. So there is a little bit of a misnomer on, you know, make them small to start off with and then I'll, um, I'll expand it because what we're seeing is the uptake of the usage of those roads, those other infrastructure projects is 
much quicker than was originally anticipated. Well, the population growth has been one of the factors, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, each state is performing differently. We can see that the strength of the economies of the businesses, uh, uh, particularly if you see the green line as New South Wales and Victoria outperforming the averages. Interestingly, Western Australia, after a long dip, is starting to pick up a little bit with its own economy. That's a good sign. Correct. Um, it's It was very resource-driven and... Uh, but luckily, over the last couple of years, we've actually seen increased demand for some of our iron ore in particular and uh, some other commodities, which Western Australia has an abundance of. Um, uh, LPG, the gases, is another energy source. So significant volumes there. So while Australia doesn't consume a lot of those goods internally, they export them. And, uh, and therefore, that's a significant boost to the economy. And as we've seen there on that chart, WA has just had a little bit of a dip of, of recent times, but it's come out of a significant doldrum. Now, we're talking about the economy here. We're not talking about the property market. Western yep. Australia's property market's been falling for four and a bit years. Having said that, what's going to happen um, is it's going to hover near the bottom for a few years before it starts to pick up. Not time for a counter-cyclical play there, in my opinion. Um, I think I mean, just on that, it's those states that have got service-driven industries that you'll see uh, pick up at a much faster rate. Good point, Ken. Now, different states have got different unemployment rates and clearly those states where employment is strong, leading to people wanting to move there, feeling comfortable about buying, are they the states that actually uh, have got stronger property markets as well? Um, we, but having said that, wages growth has been sluggish um, and in many industries there's been no wages growth at all. So uh, th this is partly due to extra participation. So while we're creating new jobs, Ken, there are more people joining the workforce or coming back to the workforce. Yeah, I, I think um, it's a function of that, of course, um, industrialization. Um, so the jobs of old aren't the jobs of today. And less people are needed for any particular uh, job. Um, education um, standards are much higher for the same job today compared to uh, five, 10 years ago. So um, we're actually seeing then those three or four factors suppressing wage growth. And while we say uh, unemployment is um, relatively low at, uh, call it at 5%, 95% of people are still employed, but vast differences in who's employed and the number of hours they work. So it's a bit of a false uh, statistic to only look at that unemployment uh, figure mm. when correlating it back to wages growth. Of course, as property investors, we're interested in what's going to happen to interest rates. And it's really unlikely that the cash rate is going to increase until wages growth goes up. Wages growth, economic growth is going to lead to eventually a bit of inflation, eventually push property prices up. But there's no reason for the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates for at least another year and probably 18 months. Uh, and most of the, the markets are suggesting that as well. But it's not interest rates that's held up our property markets. What's created the um, decline in interest in our property markets, actually not interest, it's ability to buy, is a credit wow. squeeze. And the credit squeeze has been created by APRA. So this is showing you that over the last little while, investor loans, the green line has dropped off significantly sure there's still investors out there buying and that's what this is showing um but it's decreased a bit owner occupiers are out there but total home loans um, have been uh, uh, low for a while dropping and so when people are looking for loans the banks are being more cautious they're a bit allergic to debt uh, to, uh, to risk at the moment with all that's happened in the royal commission and they're looking at responsible lending more carefully but it's impacting the property market significantly ken yeah, and look, uh, having been through quite a number of cycles, uh, given my grey hairs or lack of hairs, what's very interesting about this cycle is the the main instrument to, um, to if you like, uh, reduce the pressure on house prices 
has not been interest rates. Traditionally, no, if, uh, like the old days. correct. And, you know, um, so it's this artificial um, instructions to the banks to not lend to investors, to take into account higher living costs, to, to use seven odd percent as an interest rate to determine ability to repay. So that's actually sucked a lot of people out of the market that could have got a loan a number of years ago. So I'm not saying that's good or bad, but there's been a drying up of available money and therefore not as many people in a lot of areas. Having said that, there are still some isolated pockets in Australia that aren't doing too bad, but I think we're gonna see this pressure on, um, on the houses, I think over the next uh, little while. Well, we knew that the growth in Sydney and Melbourne was unsustainable. We knew it couldn't keep growing at double digit growth. And I'm much happier that this has happened in a low interest rate environment than the old fashioned way of raising interest rates, because it's going to be a period of time when the average home owner is not going to run into mortgage stress. We're not going to see young families get into trouble and have to lose their homes. And we're not seeing businesses having a concern about borrowing because of high interest rates. So it's actually, in my mind, a much better outcome than the way the Reserve Bank has done things the last couple of times. Um, house prices and debts always in the uh, news as Ken, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, and look, I think when we look at house prices, you know, it, it's the old, uh, you know, stick your finger in the dike to try and stop the, the water flooding in. You know, we've got reasonable uh, employment levels, reasonable wages, uh, population growth, centred economies. So there is not that many places people can go and uh, build or um, uh, buy new housing. So very limited stock. So it's just, you know, um, what is it? A, a natural, um, uh, I don't know, physics that house prices will keep growing, particularly... Well, the uh, are there. And yeah. interestingly, I remember at the turn of this last decade, 2010, I sent out a press release and the media loved it and got a lot of attention saying median house prices in Sydney are going to be a million dollars by 2020. Well, I, all I did was I extrapolated past growth yeah. and saw what was going to happen in the next 10 years and I was wrong. They got there much sooner. Much Similarly, sooner. Uh, Aussie Home Loans has recently used similar figures to suggest that median house prices in Sydney are going to get this six and a half million dollars in 25 years um, if the same growth has occurred. In Sydney and Melbourne, capital growth on the average home, the average uh, home price went up just over 8% property over the last 25 years, I meaning property values doubled every seven years or so. In other states, it was a bit less, but overall in Australia, property values doubled every 10 years. Now, with all the other things that you get from Ken and me and on Property Update, you know, but not every house is going to increase in value and not every property should do that. So it's not a blanket statement, but the fundamentals are there. I think that's what we're trying to show today, Ken, for, for a good sound future. What this is now showing, this particular graph is that dwelling construction is low. Uh, you can see over the last years, the green line at the bottom, how over the last decade, the amount of new approvals for medium and high density, actually high density, the green line is, has outpaced uh, and now we're creating more high density than detached houses. That's an interesting trend. We're trading uh, space for place. We're trading our backyards for balconies and courtyards to live in the right places. But at the moment, which is normal every cycle, and near the end when banks are making it harder, building approvals uh, taper off, and all that does is set up the uh, ability to have another property boom as population keeps growing, as demand keeps growing, as we use up the excessive supply, and then the cycle all moves around once more. So Ken, we've had a bit of fun talking through this. There's lots more, so we'll do this more often. But if the, you who are watching this webcast got some benefit from this, please do us a couple of favors. First of all, tell somebody else about it. And if you like this, leave a comment below because if you are enjoying this, Ken and I will spend time preparing and doing more of these for you to keep educating you. 
If you'd like to understand how you can grow, protect and pass on your wealth, the team at Metropole are here to help you. By the way, we've got no properties to sell, but we've got access to every property on the market uh, because our buyers agents team uh, got on the ground teams in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. Having said that, though, it's got to be in the right order. So we believe you should have strategic property plan first where we'll map out your property future and Kennedy's team specialise in doing a strategic wealth plan which really goes much further than property doesn't it Ken? It goes into asset protection, um, uh, 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 estate planning, uh, superannuation um, and a whole lot of things that I can't think of the top of my head Ken but you probably know because boy have we seen those detailed reports you do and you personally uh, will spend uh, a couple of hours with each of the clients and then go into a lot of detail in the implementation session. So go to metropole.com.au. Please uh, leave your details there. We'd love to catch up with you. Ken, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, listeners and viewers. Great. We'll catch up with you for another webinar real soon.